Han är en hår, ge vårt vår, ge vårt vinser på. Amen. Christos har jag vi med revots. Christ is risen from the dead. Says ye mes mes avedis. To you and to us, great news. So, we're at the end of our Holy Week journey, which has culminated in this most special of days, which of course culminates in Christ's conquering of death by his resurrection. Upon any honest reflection, though, concerning this gospel that we celebrate today, I think that a natural question is likely to arise in our minds that most of us desperately try to get out of our heads. Who cares? Okay, let me be more specific. It's obvious why, if it is true that Jesus rose from the dead, that's very, very good news to those who have died. Of course, this offers the hope that one day they may be raised up again. Maybe with a little bit more thought, we can see how this gospel would also be relevant to those who are rapidly approaching their death. The sort of sickbed conversion. And yet, I think that when we're honest and we look at it, it's kind of strange that we all gather to celebrate this good news. It's all of us, both the unhealthy and the healthy, both the old and the young, who gather together today to proclaim the good news that Christ rose from the dead and conquered death. And it's strange because for someone who has decades, maybe even half a century before their death, this news does not seem particularly urgent nor critical to be proclaimed to them. Right? We have these hours-long church services all focusing on the fact that Christ rose from the dead and what good news this is. With singing and incense and symbols, we pull out all the stops, all joyfully proclaiming that Christ's resurrection from the dead is good news to all of mankind. And yet, when we really look at it closely, it just does not seem to appear that this is good news unless death is approaching. So the question becomes, why should I care today while I'm living, if I'm healthy, if I'm young, if I don't see death coming rapidly. Why should I care about this gospel that I have been saved from death? I think that part of the answer to this very critical question comes to us most directly actually not through the resurrection accounts that we hear today. I actually think the answer comes a little bit earlier in the gospel from a very interesting story that we find in the gospel according to John. During this Lenten season, many of us had the opportunity to gather weekly on Zoom where we studied the seven I am statements of our Lord, right? Christ saying, this is who I am. And he gives us seven very interesting images which seem simple on the surface, and yet for those who are in those classes, certainly there's quite a lot to dive into. One of these I am statements is particularly applicable to today's feast. When Christ boldly proclaims, I am the resurrection and the life. The context of this I am statement comes right before Lazarus is raised from the dead by Christ. So it comes in the context not of Christ's own resurrection, but of the resurrection of his dear friend. And so leading up to the moment when Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, we hear an interesting dialogue between Jesus and Martha, who was one of the sisters of Lazarus. And so the setup is that Christ arrives to Martha and Mary. Um, he had been told when Lazarus was sick, but he got there too late, actually four days too late. 
So he arrives and naturally everyone is quite distraught. They had seen the incredible signs that Jesus had done. Maybe if he had gone there just a few days before, he could have risen him from the dead. And that's how Martha greets Jesus when he arrives. Martha goes, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus responds, your brother will rise again. So we hear the initial introduction of the gospel, this hope that there is a cure, there is a way to solve death. And Martha was aware of this too. This was, in the Pharisaical school of the time, a very common teaching that the dead one day would rise. And so Martha goes, yeah, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. At this point, I think that Martha gives an answer that seems to show quite a lot of faith. Maybe seems to reflect a faith that we have ourselves. Martha goes, essentially, one day far in the future, we know that God is going to bring the righteous back um, from the dead, and we know that he's going to bring them to heaven. Right? I think that's very similar to the faith that we each hold. And so you would expect at this point, Christ to say, wonderful, good job, Martha. I'm so happy that you know the truth of God. But that's not how Christ responds. Christ actually kind of rebukes her in a way with a clarification. He goes, yeah, Martha, I know that you're thinking about this resurrection on the last day at some point far away. Yes, that's what you have in your mind, but you don't get it. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? While Martha was viewing the resurrection as something far away, as something for another day, Christ made very clear the resurrection is present here today. And indeed, it was. Because at the end of the story, Christ does go and raise Lazarus from the dead that very day, immediately. And so we see something very interesting in this proclamation. Often we look to the future for Christ's miracles, but no, they are here and they are present today. This statement is very interesting when Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. I think that he's telling us some interesting things in the way that he constructs this phrase. He uses a compound phrase. He uses two parts to the way that he presents this. First, he says, I am the resurrection, right? Which makes us think of the reality that we will all one day be risen from the dead. But he adds to saying that he's the resurrection, I am the life. I am the life. Why did he need to add this thought? Isn't that encapsulated in the idea of resurrection, of rising from the dead? Seems that Christ is trying to emphasize something quite different. The fact that what he has come to offer is not simply a remedy to biological death, but a way of being able to truly begin living today, here, and now. That even for those of us whose hearts are still beating, Christ's resurrection can actually bring to each and every one of us new life. Maybe even bring us back to life. And I think that part of understanding this is accepting the reality that life is not the same as existence. Life can't be measured simply by the number of heartbeats that you have during your days on this earth. I truly believe that there are many people whose biological existences have ended long ago who are living much more so than many of us walking around on this earth today. Because, if we're honest, Many of us just roam the planet trying to subsist. What's my next meal going to be? How can I pad my wallet a little bit more? 
How can I feel a little bit more pleasure by titillating myself with this or that flight of fancy? This mode of existence, brothers and sisters, is no way of living at all. If our aimless wanderings of our 80 or so years of biological existence have no meaning beyond simply accumulating possessions, distracting ourselves with frivolous pastimes, avoiding pain and seeking pleasure, then I think that not only is that life devoid of any purpose and is absurd, but on some level, though physically reared into existence on the day of our birth, we may have never truly been born. Christ's resurrected life is not something that begins on the day of our death. It begins today. The gospel of his resurrection offers us the hope of bringing back to life those parts of our soul that have been deadened by the brokenness of our fallen world. The resurrected life that Christ has offered us is radically different from the so-called life that the world has to offer. The resurrected life is aimed at plumbing the depths of God who created the, the universe. The resurrected life is nourished from the constant outpouring of the love of the triune God, a love which is inseparable from who he is at his core. The resurrected life is infused with the mystery of the cross, that when we endure sufferings in this world, they do not need to be meaningless. That through his grace, they can be miraculously transformed into means of imparting new life to others. The resurrected life is constantly di directly it, it, the resurrection life is constantly directed by a vocation of the deepest of meanings, which is the care for and the upbuilding of neighbors by selflessly reflecting the love that we have already received from God. The resurrected life is invigorating. The acknowledgement that we can ultimately do nothing on our own efforts is where the resurrected life begins. The more that we try to do it ourselves and figure out the meaning of life and to do good on our own, we find that we fail time and time again. And yet, when we come to a place where we instead rely on the grace of the Holy Spirit for strength, we tend to find that in shocking and unexpected ways, the Holy Spirit enables us to move mountainous obstacles that confront us along our paths. The resurrected life is holy. It raises us from our basest animal appetites and it allows us to dedicate every day to a higher purpose, to serving the one who is holiness himself. And by living our lives for him, we in turn can become as he is. The resurrected life is eternal. That does not mean that it starts when we die. It can already be lived starting today, from the moment of our rebirth from the baptismal font. Even here on this earth, we have moments when we can taste the goodness of the kingdom of heaven and of eternal life. And so today, it's not just those who are approaching death who celebrate. We all come together, young and old, healthy and unhealthy, and we all celebrate and boldly proclaim the Easter Gospel. Because this news is not simply for those who have died, but for all of us who have deadness within our souls which can be raised by the resurrection and the life himself. May we each truly receive this Gospel this and every day not just in our ears, but in the depths of our soul. May we allow the resurrected life to transform our lives here and now, allowing His Spirit to dwell within us and coming more deeply day by day 
into a relationship of immeasurable love with the one who has granted it to us. It is with this resolve that we will be able to join together with the heavenly hosts and truly proclaim the Easter gospel, saying, Christ is risen from the dead, that he trampled down death by his death, and that by his resurrection he has granted each and every one of us this very day new and everlasting life. And for this death-defeating and life-granting miracle, we offer our risen Lord glory and honor forever. Amen.